we began a process two weeks ago, the night we were eliminated by Philadelphia. You know, we, we start the whole journey after a season is how we're going to get better and the road to get better. And you do a thorough evaluation from the top to the bottom of your organization. You have exit meetings, you, have, you continue to have meetings. Um, I, I'm sorry if I'm breaking up uh, the internet here, but we, we went through a process, a very thorough process, uh, did a lot of discussion, a lot of deep, deep searching uh, and reading into every possible area we can get better. And we arrived to this conclusion today the announcement that we weren't moving forward, that we were not um, going to re-sign Coach Brooks, you know, it's something that from a personal standpoint was very, very difficult. Uh, Scott is probably one of the finest people I've ever worked with in my life, one of the finest people in the NBA, certainly one of the finest people, again, that I, that I would say is one of a, a dear close friend. But in this business, we have to be about results moving forward and, and the ability to get better. And I made the decision to do this. Uh, and I look forward to, to the, the next journey for the Washington Wizards. Be able to track the head coach moving forward. But as today, I want to keep this discussion right here that it was a very difficult decision, fantastic person, a guy that was uh, very accomplished. And his record throughout his career uh, has been successful on the floor and certainly one of the best people in the community. I look back during the, the, especially in the last 15 months and the difficulties that not just the NBA, but the entire world was going through battling COVID. And Coach Brooks was unbelievable partner, an unbelievable unifier. And we all got through these very difficult, dark moments in our franchise's history because of his leadership was exemplary. So with that being said, I'll, I'm happy to take questions and uh, thank you for jumping on. I'm sorry if the internet's a little bit scrambled here. Chris Miller. Thanks, Scotty. Tommy, how much did April and kind of the success towards the end of the year kind of factor into the decision not to bring Scotty back in there? And did you guys look at the totality of the five years or was this kind of just focused on this season? Well, honestly, you, you, when you're evaluating things, it's always about the future. You know, we've had five years together. Um, I have been the GM for two years and certainly We've had some incredible highs and we had some very difficult lows. Throughout Coach Brooks' tenure here, you know, I look back the first year and the excitement when we won 49 games and you get to the second round and, and get to game seven with Boston. Certainly that, that was boding well for the future. And then, then life happens. You have injuries, you have a lot of different things. This wasn't the team that Scotty signed up for five years ago. It was a totally different look, a totally different team, uh, totally different goals at that time. And we went through a cycle and then I became the general manager and it was a very uh, you know, unified front that we were gonna develop last year. We were gonna strap this thing down a little bit and, and try to, to really focus on developing and, and finding new players and developing a culture. And Scotty was instrumental in that. The, the work ethic, the high character, uh, people that are here now, you know, he, he was a partner in every step of the way. So that, Going back to your original question, you look at everything, certainly in the past, but I can't do much about the past. I focus on the future and where we're going. And I think with that in mind, that, that was a decision that we made that there's that maybe there's a new way for us to get better. And certainly uh, that's not taken away from coach and what he was able to do. But I think it's very important that, that when you have time to really take account of everything, and especially after a season, and especially after a season like to you're alluding to where you know, we had some success, 17 and six down the stretch. We made the playoffs, 0.6 chance of ever making the playoffs. We defied Vegas. And, and those are exciting times. Those are great memories. But there's also the rest of the season prior to that and then the four years before that. And you got to factor all that stuff into uh, consideration. And I apologize for the timing of this follow-up, but I don't know when the next time we'll have a chance to talk to you, though. But is there something that needs to be checked off for the next coach that comes in here to coach this group? Um, you know, I'd rather, it's hard because I, you know, this is all today. Um, certainly we have our criteria and the process that we're going to go through. It's going to be a very thorough, very diverse, very robust search. I think there's going to be a lot of people 
uh, based, based on my voicemail and text that I've received since uh, about 11.15 this morning. I, I'm not worried about people that are interested in working as the head coach of the Washington Wizards. I'm getting bombarded. But at the same time, I think we have a very disciplined approach to this. It's going to be very thorough. You know, I think it's going to be, I can't say it enough, a very diverse, inclusive group of people that we'll look at. And, and you know, that's in due time. Ava? Hey, Tommy, um, not to be too nitpicky, but just with the language that was out there this morning and, and you just said, could you clarify that it was, I guess, your decision that was made? Obviously, I understand that, you know, two sides aren't, aren't coming to a decision. Somebody said no somewhere along the lines, but could you clarify a little bit on that? You know, I, I, I mean this sincerely. I don't know what was out there. I know that Coach Brooks and I have had dialogue for the last two weeks about how ways we can get better. And the decision was mine to move forward, uh, that we were not going to renew contracts. And I think moving forward again, I, I, I really want to focus forward. I, I don't like sharing private conversations, certainly between very two very good friends. But in, in terms of where we are and where we need to be, it was a decision I made. And um, just re referring, I guess, to the last time we talked to you about the expectations for the organization moving forward, do, do they stay the same with a new coach coming in and, and potentially someone coming from outside of the organization or anything like that? But is it still kind of play off to the baseline and, and we're expecting to build on this season? Certainly every season starts with playoffs as a goal. There's no question there, but I think I have to have a team. We collectively have to put a group together, a group of players that we evaluate, we manage the expectations, and we know precisely where we think they'll land. You know, prior to last season, once we acquired Russell, you know, we always talk about Miss Ava, the game, you know, it looks good on paper, but it's played on wood. So we went into the season with a guy who was third team all NBA that we just acquired. We had Bradley Beal, who I felt was an all NBA player prior to last night. I thought he was the prior season. So you have a pretty good backcourt, right? And so we were excited about that. And we said, our internal goal, we absolutely, this team should make the playoffs. And we didn't know we were going to enter the third ring of hell after that, where you have a very slow start, then you have COVID, then you lose Thomas Bryant, and then everything else happens. And then so you go through these twists and turns of the season, and every part of the season was kind of its own act in a very bizarre play. And then you get to the very end, and you run off 17 and 6. And that was an amazing finish to a season that was completely wild. And what we showed during that time, more than anything, I loved about our team and, and we carry forward is the grit and the stick to itiveness and the bonding that the players had for each other, the care that we had as a complete staff, everybody looking out for each other from players, coaches, management, medical equipment. You know, we have this group of people that travel really going back to the bubble last year in Orlando and the people that went through that and then where we were going through an entire season with all the, the things that I said happened, you know, that really bonded people together and showed I mean, we have fantastic people here. And that's one of our best by far qualities of this organization is the quality of people. But when you look where we landed at the end of the season and we made the playoffs, it's crazy, but that was kind of the expectation at the beginning of the season. I wouldn't try that at home. I wouldn't recommend anybody try to replicate that season, but we ended up in the playoffs where we thought we would be. DA. Hey, Tommy. Um, I know we're right at the beginning of this process. Um, but if you look at your team right now, assuming a return to health for most of your your key players uh, at some point next season, what do you think your team should do well night in and night out? You know, what do they need to get better at night in and night out? Well, certainly, I think everything starts with that backcourt and two All-NBA players. You know, there was, there should have been a fourth team. If, if Russell didn't make the third team, I, I was shocked. You know, he and Bradley both deserved to make it. I'm not saying anybody shouldn't be have made it, but I was shocked. I really thought Russell deserved it. In my mind, he's All-NBA. And so we have Bradley and Russell to, to really feature as the, as the focal point of this team. And, and what do we, where do we start? Where are our strengths? And then we sprinkle in. We have a lot of young guys. And we have a veteran uh, this year, Davis Bertans, who, who certainly 
when he was able to play, we, we had a winning, we were 29 and 27, one of the best shooters on the planet. It just that season kind of goes with the rest of the season, how things just don't quite go as according to plan, but we have him returning next year, along with Daniel Gafford, Thomas Bryant, you know, Rui and, and, and Denny, you know, that's a good building block that, to look at the future. And then we have our own free agents that we're certainly uh, going to be open <coughs> to bringing back. And then I got a story to tell in Washington, DC. You know, just like I, I'm in the recruiting business all the time, if it's free agents, now it's a head coach and a great coaching staff. You know, you don't have to try very hard to convince people Washington, D.C. is the very best city in the United States, certainly one of the premier cities in the world. We have fantastic fans. We have a great arena. We have great facilities. Monumental Sports has invested so much in, in monumental basketball and the Washington Wizards. They, they're all about winning. They're all about the resources needed to win. And the support is, is unparalleled. We have fantastic ownership. Uh, like I, I continue to say, Ted has never said no. So I think that we have a fantastic story to tell here. So I look at our team, DA, what we need now, obviously, is a head coach. We need some more depth. We need a little bit more veteran leadership to balance with our younger guys. And then, and then I, but in terms of those needs, I think we can certainly achieve all of our goals by process and doing it very thoroughly, thoroughly, excuse me. But I also believe in my heart that, that DC sells itself. The Washington Wizards will sell itself. I think there's a great deal to be excited about here. Scott Abraham. Well, first, Scott, I, I want to congratulate you. Your connection is worse than mine, so I don't finish first in the worst connection here. But I think what you were asking me about was in terms of Bradley and Russell, and particularly Russell being on record saying that, you know, his, his feelings for Scotty. And certainly I take all that into account. I had thorough conversations with everyone in our organization. So I'm aware of, of how people feel. I'm aware of how I feel. And, and Again, you've heard me say this, people that, that tune into the Wizards regularly and cover us way, regularly. I, I use a phrase and I don't really throw it around to be anything other than just honest. This is show business, it's not show friends. And what we've got to do as an organization is continue to do whatever it takes to put ourselves forward to have sustainable winning. And, and I think what Russell brought to this franchise was an absolute jolt of energy absolute, the, the pros pro, one of the most amazing players in the NBA's history. And to add that to Bradley Beal, the results kind of spoke for themselves and moving forward, I, you know, Russell's career does speak for itself. And he was fantastic with Scotty in Oki City. He won the MVP in Oki City under a different coach. Last year, he was all NBA under a different coach. So, you know, the, this is part of the business that we all struggle with, but it is certainly part of the business. And it's, it's something we know when we get into this business that, that the only constant thing is change. And we, what we're trying to do is create continuity here. And in two years, I look at where we were a year ago and where we are now, and we, we've really upped our talent level. And I think that's what we're gonna to continue to do. And after conversations with Russell, conversations with Bradley, I believe they have the confidence in, in the equity that we have in our relationships that I'm all about doing the very best thing for the Washington Wizards. And I, I show by works, not by words. And that's, that's how it has to be. And it's not just me, it's everybody involved in this franchise. And it starts with Mr. Leonsis and his group. So I'm very excited, like I said, moving forward. And I was very grateful for Bradley and for Russell's insight. I take all that into account, certainly. And a quick follow-up. In your heart of hearts, why don't you think it worked out here with Scott Brooks? I think it worked out well, you know, for, for five years, I think there was a, in terms of the, the growth and the, the culture that he installed and the things that he was about, certainly those will be here moving forward. He, he leaves big footprints in that regard for those five years that didn't show up always in the column that is the most dear to everybody's heart is winning, certainly. But in terms of what he's done, I, I, again, Scott, I'm focusing forward and where we need to be. 
So I wouldn't say it didn't work out. I just think it's time to move on. Fred? Hey, Tommy. Um, you you mentioned how this this was your decision to make, and I'm just curious, why, why did you make it? Why did you feel like this was the, the time to move on from Scott and look elsewhere? Well, again, I, I kind of try to say that at the beginning of this is, is it's about the future and where we can go and, and kind of looking at where the areas are that we struggled in the past with and what we're prepared to do to get better in those areas. So, you know, a lot of the conversations that happen throughout the year um, and, and the evaluations you do after a season, they, they kind of all feed in together to, to one big report. And, and I have to observe the information, the data, take into account all the possible relationships. And again, where is our best leverage point to get better moving forward? What do we have and where do we need to be? And that's kind of where that decision came. I, I'd like to keep most of the conversations obviously are very private, but it's just something that I, I take this job very seriously. My job is to make the Washington Wizards franchise the very best. You know, our, our co-owners are our fans. Our co-owners are the players. Everybody that, that cares about this franchise, my job is to elevate this franchise. And it's not, again, it's not one person. Everybody, we work to co collectively together. But that decision was made with the future in mind of where I think we can go. And, and as for the actual upcoming search, I'm sure you're not going to sit there and just throw names out there willy nilly. Uh, but in terms of actual traits that you you value in a coach uh, in general, what what are you guys looking for from that sort of you know culture input standpoint? So from Scott, I got heart of hearts and you use willy nilly was the term? Willy nilly, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to catch it. What was your question again? You threw me off with that? <laughs> uh, no, just what, what sorts of of uh, general traits or do you look for in, in a coach that you think kind of stabilize in that position? You know, there's not the, the days of one coach being a solution to every single, single problem that a team has is over. We, we recognize that. That's why you see a lot more uh, reliance on you have an offensive coordinator, if you will, a defensive coordinator. I think everything starts with being a great communicator. And, and I think then and that's certainly an area that Scotty thrived in, but we're, we're the areas that we're going to look for, and you know, those, those are vision checks that are key performance indicators moving forward. I, I certainly think it's you got to take a long, hard look at the defensive end. You got to look at the, see efficiency wise, can we be better offensively, defensively? And that's kind of where we're going to be leaning towards and looking at very hard. But again, that's not looking backwards, I'm only looking forward. It, it's pretty simple there. Does that answer your question willy-nilly? Sure does. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you. Barry. Tommy, you mentioned being a recruiter and having a great city and a great franchise to sell. I, I just wonder where that comes from, given that this franchise hasn't been to a conference finals since 1979. Like, what? what's the... What's the selling point? Well, you know, because something hasn't happened since some time doesn't mean it's never happened. We won a championship in 1978. So you know what can happen again here. But I, and I can't speak to all the years that I wasn't here. I can speak to the two years I've been the general manager that I've never had anybody not say, hey, I'm not interested in coming to DC. Certainly money is a factor in the way that the cap works in terms of players, but we're talking about areas that are uncapped when you bring in coaching staffs and medical staffs and support personnel, all these areas. Those are areas that we can really do, do great things in. It's uncapped. The NBA can't say, hey, you can't hire that person or this person. And, you know, you spend money wisely. You don't spend it foolishly. But I do believe D.C. sells itself. And as a, as a, I'm not a native Washingtonian. But my time in this city, it is home to me and, and to our seven children and couldn't have ever been a better place to, to raise a family. And I, I extol the virtues of DC to everybody who comes here. So I, I think in terms of the winning, you know, you cover sports for a living, you, you, the well diverse background of what you do. You look and you, nobody ever thought, gosh, an expansion, here comes a baseball team because they won a championship. They did. The Capitals won a championship. The Wizards have won a championship in their past. The Mystics have won a championship. Teams come here, they, 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 they it's a, it's a, the district of champions is a real term. 
and quite frankly, that's what I'm. Uh, that's the the standard we want to be held to. But before you can win a championship, you you have to get mile markers that you you feel like, hey, did we reach this? Did we reach that? In a year's term, you know, when we sat back, if we could rewind and, and you go back to the preseason, you know, I think it was it was okay to say, hey, we expect to make the playoffs, and we were managing expectations after injuries, certainly. But it starts with that, and once you do that, then you climb and. and the ways to get better are incremental. Nobody goes straight to the championship over overnight, certainly. But I'm very inspired by the fact that people have done it here before in DC. People have done it before in our building. And it certainly gives me a great deal of motivation that get the Wizards there. But you can't put it the quick, without the work. I'm sorry. Just as a quick follow up, but two years ago, the structure, the front office structure that you work in now was put into place um, two summers ago. How do you feel like it's played out? You've got a big collaborative effort with a lot of minds there. Um, how, how is it working? I think it's one of our greatest resources, honestly. We, we have fantastic collaboration. Everybody, you know, certainly we all have our boundaries and we know what our jobs are to do in, in mind and basketball and what we have to do for the Wizards. But that you live in a community together. And we lean on each other and we glean information from each other. We ask wisdom from each other. And I think that's been fantastic. You know, the, the ability to just walk down the hall and I catch up with Sasha on some, on some issues, go down to the medical area. You know, all of us work together. And then, you know, as we approach June 18th, I'm reminded of the amazing efforts of our staff last year for the march that Bradley and Natasha led on Juneteenth. And the way that John Thompson was able to jump in, help, they formed a staff with Sashia Jones, with Sashi Brown, that right there, you know, that, that just speaks so loudly about the resources coming together and the unifying of great resources together. And, and that, that is something to this day, it's one of the proudest things I think I've ever been involved with with the Washington Wizards was, was Juneteenth. And that was amazing. To, to think about what went into that and how quick it came together because of the resources we have. And, and so what, what Bradley said that day, you know, it, it sends chills up your spine. That's a very proud moment for monumental basketball for Washington Wizards and certainly for the Mystics and you know, for DC. I think that that spoke a lot and we don't forget that. We don't, it's not something that, when did that happen? And we all know, and we all continue to push that, push for better circumstances, certainly, but, but social issues, Social justice, that, that is what this is about. We use that platform, we use our voice through sports. And Bradley that day was, was the absolute flag bearer for our organization, but he had a lot of help from people like Sashi, from Sashia, from John Thompson. You know, that's the benefit of having that, that set up. So I'm sorry for the filibuster, but I'm very passionate about that group. We have great resources and that speaks to well, to me, it speaks well of our, of our ownership group. Thanks, Tom. Don't ask me to repeat it, Barry. I was going too long. I can't remember what the heck. But I, I, I didn't see you writing it down. Hopefully you're recording this. We, we got it recorded here. I'll, it'll only take me 45 minutes to transcribe. Especially when I mumble. I, I'm a, I realize I'm a low talker. I apologize. Chase. Hey, Tommy. Um, given you have Bradley Beal and Russell Westbrook, and you know, as you've said, expectations to, to make the playoffs next year, how much will coaching experience, head coaching experience, just experience in general factor into your decision? Well, I think you, you look at everything that goes into being a head coach and you want the qualities that, that you think are going to amplify the needs of your team. So certainly, and I look, you know, let's be honest, you look at the modern NBA, what's going on, who's in the finals right now, or who's in the, who's in the, in the, in still playing. Okay. And it's a great, it's a great snapshot of what the NBA is. You have very diverse coaches. You, you have former players. You have people that came from Division II colleges. You know, it, it's it's just a reminder that there's no clear path of how to get there. There's no magic formula, but there's no one great person that's going to solve all this. I think it's all about the staff you put together because everybody, you know, if you're a first-time head coach or a head coach that's coached a 1,000 games, you still have to go coach the next game no matter what your resume to that point that got you there, you still have to go out and do these things. And, and this is a cruel game too, at times. And you're watching these series play out and it's, you know, when somebody goes up 2-0, someone goes down all of a sudden and it's 2-2 and there's tons of injuries and all these different things happen. And just a reminder how 
best laid plans can can blow up in your face. There's so much luck that's involved in this, but you still, we all still trying to rob the same train. We're all building to try to win a championship. And it starts certainly with that. The head coaching job, Barnum, is the hardest job in an organization. It's the hardest job in any NBA franchise. So there's a lot that goes into that. And, and I think being supportive of that position, having empathy for that position every day, I believe that's something we do very well here. And I think that's something moving forward that, that you know, I, that's, I preach that to our staff every single day. Everybody that thinks they would have done something different in crunch time in this game or that game. Have you ever coached a game? No. You have to have empathy for that person. And you got to remember sometimes that dang round ball, it'll roll around that rim and it, all, it goes in, you're a genius. And it rolls out and they go, God, you should never have done that. You should never call that. You should never call that play. But it goes in, you're a genius. Like, you really want your career to be defined by the actions of a basketball. But that's what we all signed up for. This is the life that we chose and we understand that. And what ty type of timeline do you envision for this process? I'd, I'd like to say, you know, to get the right person. I, I don't think it's, you know, we are certainly not this time next, next week. And, you know, ideally you, when you get into free agency, I think there's a, an element that players would like to know, you know, who's the coach, what's their vision, what are we about? So certainly, you know, August 2nd is, is out there in a distant place, but it, I, I don't like to get sped up. I think patience is a competitive advantage. And I think we're going to go through this very thoroughly and, and we, we come with a conclusion, this is the right person for this franchise and it'll be, it'll be the right decision we believe. And, and then at that time, but to pick a date on a calendar, Chase, I couldn't do that. I don't think that's wise. Matt? Hi, Tommy. I'm curious, in using this two weeks to evaluate the situation, how much did you find yourself having to change your mind or, or instinctively going one way, but saying, oh, I need more information to process? Just could you kind of like, because you've known Scott for five years and, and that sort of thing, like, I guess you have instincts one way or another. Like, how do you kind of try and combat those throughout this process and keeping an open mind? Well, what I do with any decision I make is, is you got to lay options on the table. Option one, two, three, four, five. What if we do this, this, and this? And that's really where the focus is. And you take all the remaining issues that, that maybe came out of exit interviews, maybe issues that you saw throughout the year, and you try to, you know, really work through those mentally, certainly, but socially. I talked to all of our players, our coaches, anybody on staff that has a stake in this team and get opinions and you get input and you verify it with data, you verify it with actionable things. You know, there's so much emotion, Matt, that happens uh, the night after a game. Two weeks ago, we were eliminated. The next day we're doing exit interviews. I don't know that those necessarily, that, that's because that's kind of the tradition in sports. I like to take a little bit of time and step away and let it, let it breathe a little bit let everybody get their emotions in check because, you know, it's just so raw to the NBA season. You're on a cadence and we're constantly moving and we're flying here. We're flying there. You get to the playoffs and the high of getting to the playoffs and everybody's excited and then boom, everything's over in a heartbeat second. You know, and the next day you're the trash bags coming out and, and guys grab their stuff and go to the cars and we talk about, okay, we're going to check in the middle of June and we have our schedules and then, then a full building's empty. Right. So the process to do this, you know, I, I never question the process that we put together. Certainly there's dark moments and there's times where you go, you know what, this, are we doing the right thing? I think that's natural. I think that's, that's human. But at the end of the day, it's, it's the decision that comes out of it. We're aligned and we move forward. This one was particularly difficult for me from a friendship standpoint. And as I said, Scott is one of the finest people I've ever dealt with in my life. And we went through some very dark times together. And, and so that, that made it difficult, Matt. But when you line up all the options of what you got to do, it's, uh, it's why you do take your time to make the big decisions. I don't think you ever need to make a, a hasty decision or a hasty gut decision in those things. Um, I don't think those are wise at all. And I think you, you can kind of see around the league, you know, there's evidence of, of things that maybe people want to have a mulligan on. And there's, there's other places where you say, wow, I, I study people's decisions all the time, particularly in the NBA, particularly in transactions, but just in life, what, what made something successful? If it wasn't successful, why? And you study the autopsy, what, what could have they've done better? 
and that's all I try to do for the Washington Wizards. And with our staff, I think we've done a very thorough job of evaluating this situation. And, and the decision made today is to move forward. And that's something I don't think we're going to uh, look back on. We got to look forward. And you mentioned, sorry, just real quick, you, you mentioned um, having a coach hopefully by free agency. Uh, just curious, is there a situation where you wouldn't have one by the draft even? Uh, again, I, I'm not picking days on the calendar. I, I think the draft certainly is part of that. I think any any coach uh, wants to be have a have a have a, an opportunity to observe as we put our talent and everything together. But I think free agency is is a far more significant event for anybody that's considering teams and what they want to do. The draft is is very very important for the lifeblood of the organization, certainly in the talent. But I think most coaches want to know who. Who's the free agents? Who, who are the front line guys? And you sprinkle in the rookies. You know, I think talent acquisition comes in so many different forms, and we show that on our roster, from the trades, from free agency, from drafting, from claiming guys off of waivers. So, the again, I don't try to say when we'll be done. Hey, maybe we're done in three weeks. Maybe we're done before the draft. But in all likelihood, I think this this will be done when we know we did the best job and, and we arrived at the right person. Thank you. Time for a couple more here, uh, Glenn. Tommy. Hey, um, George, take your off. no way. <laughs> Tommy, hey, buddy. Um, I know that you have vision for the organization, and I know your heart's in this thing. And, um, you know, I, I, I know that you look at other teams as well to see what makes them successful. You look at Phoenix with Chris Paul and, and Devin Booker. Um, in, the, in the process of you trying to, you know, get the best coach possible, what style of play um, do you think that, you know, a, a coach that takes this team over now is gonna, is gonna look to play? Like, what, what are some of the things you're looking for from that vision standpoint? in style of play and in the coach? Well, Glenn, if I tell you, then people are going to know how to prep and read and, and they're going to answer to what they think they want, that I want to hear. I know. So that's a dumb question then, right? <laughs> I, I really, but, yeah, but you know, you, it's important you, they get the evaluation of every candidate they come in and they evaluate our roster. What would you do with this? I think that's a fair question. I'm just teasing it and there's no dumb questions, Glenn. But I think for me, you know, this is way too early. To, to say this is exactly what we're looking for. I would be very obvious to state that we have a pretty uh, talented backcourt, all right? And how can we take advantage? How can we make the game easier? Brad the Bill's usually seen with three people at all times when he has the ball. He sees triple teams, double teams everywhere he goes. How can we make his life easier? How can we complement him and Russell with, with maybe some more outside scoring and depth, those kinds of things. But that those problems are going to be there no matter who the coach is. You have to have the talent to put out on the floor and and continue to thrive in the NBA. So that there's you kind of have a foot in both worlds. How what can the coach do, and how can we help the coach with the talent that we assemble? So it's an ongoing pursuit for sure. Thank you. That's your, that's the one question today, Glenn. And we'll wrap it up with Ben Standing. Hey, Tommy. Um, I'm just curious. Um, you said this was your decision to make, but presumably you did speak with others in the organization, including the owner, who I don't think we've heard anybody's mentioned yet. I'm uh, just curious about um, that process and kind of what was your conversations with uh, Chad Leonsis? You know, again, conversations are private, but I, I approached Ted as, you know, he came in and did exit interviews himself. He, he like, this is such a strange world, but usually beginning of the season, Ted comes to practice during the season. He, we do a business of basketball program. He speaks to the team and he's at all the games and he knows all of our players, all of our staff. And really since March of last year, he lost that connection, literally not being. So he was meeting a lot of people physically for the very first time. And it was an opportunity for him to get to meet some of our players. Like, you know, he hadn't met Daniel Gafford in person. And, and Daniel was an employee for us for 23 games. And, and for Ted not to know that guy and get a chance to shake his hand and get to know about, get to know him firsthand was very, very unusual. 
So for Ted, you know, he, he was able to meet those players in, in the exit interviews for the first time in many cases. He was able to come to a couple of playoff games, but he wasn't able to, he wasn't on our tier, if you will, couldn't come to the locker room, those things. But the conversation I had with Ted after the season was that, hey, I, I want to give you a thorough review and I need some time. And he said, take all the time you need. And throughout, I would, I would update him, certainly. And I said, you know, I'm feeling a certain way. And we talk about that. And then I'd come back to him and looking at these things. And these are kind of some of the stuff that all this evaluation is leading me towards. And, and he would listen. And I would just, I said, Ted, Ed, this is a decision I believe I've arrived upon. And I gave it to him. And he said, that's, if that's what you want to do, then that's what you do. That's, that's the amazing ability of, of him to empower his people to do the very best job. He just keep him informed, let him know why you make these decisions, but there was never an issue. So and was very grateful to Scotty for his service and what he was done here, but he understood my decision and he supported it. And, and obviously this is, as you get going here, you, if, if you're gonna be the one making a decision, that's obviously a big opportunity for you to help reshape this uh, group. And I'm just curious, at times it seemed like from the outside, maybe some potential disconnect with players put on the roster and how they were used. How important is that relationship between the front office and the coaching staff moving forward to be on the same page when it comes to type of players you have, how to use them and so on? Yeah, I, I have a great deal of empathy and particularly, you know, you, you yourself, you usually come to games not having that ability this year. I can promise you there was never a disconnect. We talked about any time we were doing lineup changes or anything. My advice to every coach is, is you do what you need to do. This is their team. You know, I, I'm going to advise and we, we sit there in a supporting role. As I said, it's the hardest job in the NBA. Um, I've, I've never told the coach what to run or who to play and they don't tell us who to draft. It's a collective group. I think everybody has a say, not everybody has a vote, but certainly the the general manager head coach relationship, I think is very, very critical communication, transparency at all times. And that's something I look forward to in the future, but that's certainly something I have for the, for the time I worked with coach Brooks. He, he's tre tremendous partner in that. There was never a disconnect. There were certainly times where injuries forced certain lineups that hey, we, we watch and they don't work or whatever, but that doesn't mean there's a disconnect. That means you try something that doesn't work and you move to the next thing. But so I, and be honest, I, I'm not sure exactly where you're referring to, but I think if you were at games every night, it wouldn't seem as strange as maybe tuning into a game from afar. Um, but if you watch our team, usually I, th I think you watch our games throughout the year. I think we found a roster by, by trade deadline that we settled in on. And I think that's one we'll move forward with. When, whenever something doesn't work out, I, I think in two years, from our, for our staff, we've shown uh, we'll move on trying to acquire the best talent we can. And, and we're not afraid to take swings. We're not afraid to look at other things.